welcome everybody to uh, chapter two's webinar. Um, I'm Sophie Rigby and um, I'm absolutely delighted today to welcome our fabulous panellists, um, Craig Morgans and Matt Staley. Um, a huge thank you to you both for joining us um, and for bringing your uh, experience and your expertise to the table. Um, we couldn't do it without you, so thank you very much. Um, so the plan today, the, the challenge today is to understand, um, you know, how we might start to think about getting unstuck, how we might go about empowering our talent strategies. And um, we've got 45 minutes, um, we, which will fly as it always does. And um, what we want to do is just really get into an understanding of current trends, current themes that you might be seeing, um, some of the challenges that you might be facing, um, and uh, how we might go about sort of, uh, you know, rectifying that or steps that, that we might need to take um, to improve or amend our talent strategies. Um, so what I thought we could do is start with a little intro from you both, just um, as I won't do it justice, and um, you can tell us a little bit about your experience so far and the roles that you currently do. Um, and then we'll we'll kick off and we'll go for it from there. Um, just for all the um, attendees, there is the uh, ability to um, ask questions. Please ask throughout anything that you want to, to ask. We can either raise it at the time if it's a topic that we're covering, um, and there will also be some time at the end for questions. Um, I'm going to uh, raise a poll as well, which we'd love to um, uh, for you to, to take part in and to give us your feedback again, to kind of drive the conversation and understand where your challenges might currently lie. Okay, so um, Matt, over to you. Um, if you can just give us a bit of an intro, that would be great. Perfect, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm Matt Staley. Um, I'm HR and Talent Director at RICO. Um, I've been with RICO now for, I think, seven or eight years. Um, always, generally, I keep trying to run away from talent acquisition is the truth, Sophie, but it keeps chasing me back. <laughs> It's in my DNA and I absolutely love it. I've been working in and around recruitment since I graduated in 98. Um, so initially as an exec search consultant and then moving in-house with Fujitsu, um, where I looked after their uh, recruitment across Europe and then a similar role with um, another big SICSC uh, before joining RICO. So that's kind of my background. Brilliant. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. And Craig, over to you. Thank you. Uh, so, yes, Craig Morgans. Um, I've, I started my career too far ago to even bring a number <laughs> or even go, go towards that number. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, but it was back in personnel, which probably tells you a bit of a story there. Um, I, I started in generalist HR um, and then similar to Matt, I actually I got the bug. I spent a couple of years working in a specialist TA team and and sort of it yeah recruitment then started running through my blood and it's then been a sort of a mainstay throughout the rest of my career I've worked for some exceptional some really large brands some great brands like LV Cadbury's the AA um, but most recently and uh, at the moment I'm the talent acquisition lead uh, for the direct line group so home to some of um, household brands like uh, direct line, Churchill, Privilege, Green Flag, etc. Um, really looking at developing a strategy which is focused on innovation, um, supporting the transformation of the organization, as well as the acquisition function, and mm -hmm. looking at everything across the whole of the candidate and uh, well, the candidate stroke employee life cycle and journey, um, mm -hmm. and development of our EVP and employer brand. Um, got a team who sit underneath me who, who support with that as well. So that's a bit about me. And doing it very well, Craig. I've obviously we're connected on LinkedIn. I see everything that you're doing, and there's a lot of activity and there's lots going on. So I'm sure you're making really good progress. Um, so obviously, both from very uh, well known, very reputable brands, and I think what would be really interesting is to understand, um, you know, your experiences currently, um, challenges or maybe not challenges. We'd love to know a little bit more about what you're kind of facing and what you're seeing in terms of trends. Um, uh, themes, any shifts in the market, and um, because I certainly know what what I'm feeling and what I kind of hear with my with my um, conversations with my clients on a, on an ongoing basis, that it feels like it's a challenge. We're three months into the year, we're about to kick off um, a new financial year, and um, potentially people might not be uh, when I say people, TA leaders, TA teams, 
may not be where they want to be in terms of their strategic workforce plan um, or their strategy. Um, and so it's kind of taking a step back and, and assessing what the challenge currently is and whether we need to adapt to that and, and start to think outside the, the box a little bit. But first of all, understanding actually what is that challenge? So, I mean, if you can share, um, you know, Craig, tell us what, what are you currently experiencing? Um, so challenges, I, we, we could probably use the whole 45 minutes for that conversation, <laughs> okay. really, couldn't we? I, I think the main conversation, you can, and you can pull it out in terms of one key word, which is the engagement. So looking at the, the talent pools and the types of people who you need to engage to uh, yeah, attract to your organisation, that is now harder than it's ever been. And, and that's probably what it is for several, probably more than several different reasons. So actually trying to get a conversation with people is more difficult than it's ever been before. Um, so we're facing A into that challenge, the, the pace of the market at the moment as well. And there just seems to be this insane desire to get candidates through a recruitment process as quickly as you possibly can in the fear that you may miss out. Um, and I think that's going to lead to uh, well, it's going to be of the detriment both of the candidate experience, but also the candidates and, and probably the organisations who are moving too quickly and, and are making poor decisions because of that speed to market. But I'd say our, our main our main challenge is around yet yeah, engaging with the talent pools and actually getting our brand and our proposition in front of them. Yeah, absolutely. OK, um, Matt, what about you? Are, you? are you experiencing something similar? Yeah, and we'll, we'll probably talk about the the kind of the transformation that's going on in RICO a little later. But I think yeah. um, I, I, too, would agree with the word that Craig has picked their engagement. And in RICO, we kind of look at our talent pools very broadly. And, and that's a, a kind of a strategic decision. So I think I think what I'm seeing is um, a greater emphasis on providing learning and opportunity to people within our organization so so almost um you know often in in kind of recruitment we always and managers are often a little bit guilty of this is thinking that the best people don't work for you already mm -hmm. and and i think the big shift that, that we've driven in rico in the last two or three years is to switch that emphasis completely and say actually we, we've already got some of the best people we just need to align them better to opportunity, align them better to our strategic direction yeah. and, and actually make great use of the talent which we already um, which already works with Rico. And, and, and that has a knock on effect. So it has a massive knock on effect on your need to recruit externally. It, yes. it diminishes it, actually. And where you do need to recruit externally, you can recruit typically at a more junior level. So I think it, it is about engagement. It's about our employee engagement. And, and therefore, what if you manage that well as part of your overall talent strategy, how, what impact does that have on talent acquisition? It, it can only have a positive impact. And yes. That was my kind of opening statement. Yeah. And, and I think coming back to the pace thing, I think that's directing a lot of organisations to just be in this transactional hamster wheel of got a vacancy, fill it. Or oh, there's another, another vacancy, fill it. And, and again, yeah. that hamster wheel of just doing that as quickly as you possibly can. And you don't you don't get time to come up for air mm -hmm. and you don't get time to have a look at the longer term strategic ambition of not just the TA function, but how that fits within the organization and how you can assist longer term and build yeah. talent pools. All of the things that you would deliver to support your, 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 your longer term TA strategy. Yes, absolutely. OK, so with that with that point in mind, um, I think it kind of leads on to the word agile, being agile within your talent team and, and working, um, you know, in an agile way, which I think is really tough, actually, when you've got a long term strategy, but then you've also got short term uh, challenges. Is that something that um, you would um, recommend people try to partner? So a longer term strategy, but shorter term, or would you recommend that they have that, that, that teams set the strategy, they have their plan? And they stick with it, you know, in spite of these kind of barriers to success popping up along the way, because we've all heard about the great attrition, you know, whether or not you're personally experiencing that within your teams. There's there's always going to be, um, you know, things in the road that are going to pop up and you've got to, you know, work around them. So 
what would be your advice there? How can you build that agility into the process? So I, <clears throat> jumping in straight there, I think it's a combination of the two. I don't think you can get away from having the longer term objectives and, and the vision and things to aim for. But actually, mm -hmm. if you think about what agile is, it's around speed and flexibility. Yeah. So for me, agile processes aren't just about that, but it's adapting. It's about keeping up to changes. It's around teamwork. So having multidisciplinary teams. So you've got the ability to go and almost throw resource at where the, where the instant demand are. Um, also, if you're looking then around candidate experience, it's flexing that depending on, again, what the market is telling you. So you mm -hmm. may need to move faster. You may need to enhance your candidate experience. It might be about the authenticity, might be your tone of voice, all those types of things. If you're not agile and you don't adapt to those and data, then you're going to get left behind. You're going to miss the boat. So I, I do think it's a combination. Yeah. Matt, what do you think? I can't add to that. Sophie, that, that was just the first <laughs> I can say. <laughs> <That's> what he <laughs> said. <laughs> no, I think you're I think you're absolutely right. Um, and um, I think, Matt, just going back to your point as well, because I think it's a really key one and I want to talk about it in a little bit more detail. Um, I mean, Rico were um, the winners of the Re Internal Recruitment Strategy Award at the Firm Awards, which is a huge accolade. Yeah. Um, was, the, um, was your internal strategy part of that in terms of the Scala Digital Talent Programme that we talked about before? Can you share that yeah. a little bit more? Because I think that's... It's been a huge success, but I think people would be really interested to know more about that. Yes, yeah, so, so um, Rico is going through a huge transformation. So we we yeah we're probably best known for our print devices and machines that you know most companies, many companies have in their offices. Um, yeah, that market is in gradual decline. Um, COVID only accelerated that, mm -hmm. and so we're we're changing what we do dramatically. And, and, and what that means is we've got almost a surplus of one kind of skill and a, and a massive demand for another kind of skill. Yes. We're not the kind of organization that's just going to fire thousands of people over here and then rehire thousands of people over here. You know, that's not only cruel, but it's also, um, you know, economically, it's not not viable. So, so we had to come up with a talent strategy, which um enabled us to understand the talent that we've already got, combine that with brilliant learning and certification. So the, the talent enablement side of things, working hand in hand with talent acquisition to look at how we can give that talent the right skills such that the, the demand which we're creating in growing areas of our business can be fulfilled more readily internally. So I think what, what made it's a winning program is is because it wasn't just talent acquisition it, it brought together a lot of elements of generalist hr really into a really brilliant package of, of ideas which we, we could take to our employees um which was just opportunity for them you know they 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 I'm, I'm, I'm yet to find an employee really who doesn't want to grow and who doesn't want to you know further their career we were able to give them all of that uh, or selected people all of that in in one neat package so it, it it the award was for talent acquisition but actually i think the reason it won was because it was a much broader uh, program of activities that that came together mm -hmm. yeah and has it has it i mean i don't know um if it's been running for long enough to have seen those results, but has it then also sort of killed two birds with one stone in terms of reducing that, that attrition as well? Completely. So, you know, we look at the success in, in a number of ways. So um, and, and measuring, so, so we can all look at programmes like this and think, yeah, that's a good idea. And, and it is a good idea. But unless you kind of measure it and can prove that it was a good idea through data, it, it's kind of um, yeah a bit pointless. So we look at um, the the reduction in the number of potential redundancies. Yeah. So um, you know that's a key measure that I'm I'm targeted targeted on, and then filling open vacancies through people who have come through that program. So from a cost perspective. 
it's massively win-win because we're, we're not spending redundancy money on the one side and we're also not spending recruitment money on the other side. So yeah. um, the, the spend is in the middle, which is kind of uh, transforming people's skill set um, in the middle, which is an investment. So, it, so whilst it, there is a cost associated with that, it's genuinely an investment in, in those people and our business. So mm -hmm. strategic, if you, you can look at that from whatever angle you want, it, it's just a great, it's just a great way of operating. And the next step is for, for Scala is to, is to take it external. Yes. So, so rather than that just being something that's purely for our own employees, actually the same exists outside. So there's people outside of Rico who want to learn and transform. So the package that we're taking to the market, and it's it's just started in the last, or it's starting very soon in our South African business, is hiring people to join Scala mm -hmm. as a program. Mm -hmm. So they're going to join Rika. They're not going to have all the skills that we want. Yeah. But we're going to give them the skills they want. And that's the message that's going out to the market. And that addresses the skill shortage, the, you know, all of the stuff that we're kind of needing to be agile for actually mm -hmm. go to the market and not want to hire the 100 percent perfect candidate. That takes the pressure off your TA. So mm -hmm. it, it's a very powerful package that I think we've we've created. Yeah, absolutely. I think as well that leads on to what we've all talked about previously and um, I know that you have similar um, uh, plans or evolution with the companies that you work for so we won't call it a digital transformation but we'll just say there's there's kind of work going on um, in terms of how you're known what you're known for as employers um, so and and it's not necessarily in the digital world as a kind of you know primary thought um so i'd love to know a little bit more about that craig you've mentioned it before as well um how you're kind of evolving what you're doing in terms of talent acquisition to make sure that you're highlighting actually what a great place it's, it is to work for you know tech candidates or, or whatever it might be highlighting the different areas how are you finding that so we're, yeah we're we're on a um we're on a journey and I think <clears throat> actually part of the research and insight that we've done and some of the competitor analysis and looking externally is you know transformation is probably an overused word because everybody is on a transformation <laughs> um, if you're not as an organization you're standing still and going backwards so there's no point comparing ourselves and saying oh look come and come and join us and you, you know part of a transformation because a b and c are doing exactly the same thing yeah. so we've we've gone and we've gone into a massive amount of research and insight about our EVP, so our employee value proposition, you know, that whole, the reason why somebody would want to join and the reason that why they want to stay with your organization and actually bringing that to life for us. We're, <clears throat> if you look at it, we've got a great overarching brand. And then the brands that I mentioned at the beginning all have little mini subcultures, we've got Green Flag, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, you come in and you work for DLG or Direct Line Group, but you might end up working for one of the other products. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a lot of us, and a lot, sorry, a lot of what we've been doing is, is actually going into yeah, the, the individual motivations, the passions, the desires. So we'll end up with an EVP and employer brand, which is overarching, but probably tactical value propositions that sit within each of those brands and buckets. Mm -hmm we're doing it properly it's not just a, you know the pretty pictures on a page that sit on a careers website we're really looking at this from an employee life cycle perspective so what we're promising people a bit like ron seal what's on the tin actually ends up being what's what's in the tin yeah. um so we're going to be looking at not just the front end of engagement attraction assessment onboarding we're looking at the rest of the life cycle as well and we're terming them all of the matter the moments that matter so everything from I'm promoted, I'm seconded, I go on maternity leave, all the way to the offboarding, and you then become alumni. We're going to be looking at all of that to make sure it's consistent and putting measurement in as well. Um, yeah. and, and that's key and critical for me. And, and Matt's mentioned, you know, data metrics, et cetera. There's no, there's no point doing all of this work and spending all of this time and effort on research unless you're actually validating it and it's proving you know that return on investment it's making an impact and a big piece for me is that whole question of 
does this resonate with you? So you've engaged with this brand, you've gone through that life cycle, we'll test and measure that. So does, does, you know, does our tone of voice live up? Does our recruitment process live up to the expectations and what we promised, but also six months in, you know, is this organization what we said it was going to be? And then 12, and then 12 months in and consistently through there and, and not leaving it then at the front door, not just the front door, but leaving it and then saying, right, we've done this. We'll move on. We'll come back and look again in three years time. Mm -hmm. We really need to look and test and validate this probably on a you know, at least a six to 12 month basis just to make sure that it is still doing everything it needs to do mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah absolutely it's not something that can be done quickly at all is it it's something you've got to learn from and, and like you say it's got to keep evolving um, if you do and, and, and I think sorry jumping in there Sophie I mean yeah. if you there's two levers well there's many different levers with EVP and brand cost time resource all those are major key parts of this but it is so fundamental to the success of a TA and mm -hmm. HR function and your organization, if you try and do it quick or on the cheap, you get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And you'll just, you'll very quickly be in a position where you've then got to go back and do it, unpick lots of stuff and mm -hmm. probably spend twice the amount of time and resource and effort and money anyway, getting it right again. So yeah, it's, it's absolutely critical getting it right first time. Yeah, absolutely. And so Let's say you're looking at that longer term plan, EVP and employer brand absolutely play a pivotal role there. What about those people um, that are sitting and they've got a certain team size and they've got a certain number of roles that are live and they just don't know where to start in terms of actually kind of, you know, working through that and, and getting getting some of those roles placed, etc. How do you avoid, Craig, you mentioned it, you know, it's just about avoiding it being a bums on seats approach. How At this point, is there anything that you kind of would recommend or, or you think you've seen that works to try and steer clear of that? Continue to work yeah. smarter, I, <clears throat> smarter, I suppose. It, it does come back to giving yourself a little bit of that leeway and that time to look at the longer term piece, because unless you get that right, you're never going to get into a position where you're going to be on the front foot. Um, it was about six months ago, I had somebody from a, a competitor of a previous organization approach me and, and he asked me the question, how do I fill 90 of these types of vacancies quickly? And yeah. my answer was, there's no silver bullet. here. <laughs> it's, not, you, it's not going to happen. Yeah. You need to get everything right in terms of your process, in terms of your strategy and all of that lined up. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'll just constantly be firefighting and you'll constantly be behind. Yes. So give yourself enough time, resource, et cetera, to look at some of those longer term pieces. And it does. And, and again, I come back to the engagement word. And I sound like a bit of a stuck record. You know, attraction for me the old school talent attraction of posting and praying that somebody applies for your job didn't yeah. work two, three years ago, let alone, you know, after COVID, et cetera, mm -hmm. you're good candidates getting conversations with them. It has to be an engagement. You've got to think more consumer. What is going to make me want to engage with that organization and buy their product, which is a big product at the end of the day. It's a career. You know, it's almost like buying a new car or a new house. It's not buying a can of Coke. Yes, so yeah. you've really got to have something which is compelling and authentic to actually put in front of somebody and mm -hmm. that takes and that takes time to get that right the bit that's just occurring to me listening to craig as well and, and looking at what we're trying to do a lot of it is about the the capability of your talent acquisition team as well and the credibility that they have because um you know, in, in many instances, they, they need to be influencing, well, in all influence, in, in all in all aspects, they're influencing the hiring community. But, um, you know, it comes to the thing that springs to mind is data as well. So mm -hmm. we're, we're using things like Horsefly, we're using things like LinkedIn Analytics, because sometimes the reality is we're asked to find things that simply don't exist. And, and in the past, you would, you would, you know, it would be the talent acquisition consultant who would be saying, look, I've been looking for three months now and I've done everything I can possibly think of. Yeah, absolutely. I, I simply cannot find this skill set. Yes. Um, now you can back that statement up with data and you can mm. actually say, look, not only have I been, I've been looking for a month, um, but I can show you what, what's actually available, you know, what, what we can yeah. see from a data perspective in the market. Yeah. Or better still, they're having that conversation up front. So they're taking that horse flow, that LinkedIn analytics data to the meeting and saying, I know you're going to be looking for one of these in Bradford. 
I can tell you that there are five people in West Yorkshire. Yeah. And, and that's it. So unless we can attract those five people, this is going to be blooming hard. Yeah. What else can we do? How else can we, you know, and, that, and that's when you can start to bring in talent enablement conversations, the contingent market, maybe for a period of time whilst you, you retrain. You know, the, you, you've got to think much wider than, you know, the, 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 the kind of the, uh, the wheel idea. You've you got to find a way of getting off that wheel. Mm. And, and data and credibility can really help that and come up with different ways of solving the, the talent problem. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's a, think, there's a great question, Sophie, that's come through around, it, around the engagement. Sorry, jump yeah. in. There. Doing your job for you. Sorry. Um, no, around, no, jump in, jump yeah, in. Yeah, employee generated content and, and perhaps on social and how yes. effective is it? It's quite, I mean, timely. I was on a call with my, my team this morning around an employee advocacy program. So that's something absolutely we're going to look to do here. And actually one of the most successful projects that I've ever been involved with um, in the previous organization was around true authentic live content of our, our employees and it wasn't necessarily well a it wasn't curated it wasn't here's a script and this is what we want to tell it was around stories it was about individual stories what their motivations their passions their desires are what value they wanted um and and that was one of the best so I, it's not that I want to replicate that coming into DLG, but actually mm -hmm. the authentic view of individuals and their stories is absolutely something that we're going to be looking to do here. Because mm -hmm. I think all of the, the research, all of the insight and all of the conversations with candidates is, you know, they can spot nicely crafted video content or a day in the life content, which is scripted and they, they don't believe it anymore. And you can see the engagement levels of those types of executions have just gone down and down over the course of the last couple of years. So you've really got to find a different way to tap in to get that conversation started. Yes. Some of it could be fun. Some of it could be an innovative, so augmented reality, you know, just tapping into, but it always has to come back to what's going to engage that particular talent pool. And that might be different. So if you take my organization, we talk in pricing and underwriting, we look at tech and data, we look at contact center, how to talk to those talent pools is very, very different. The messages are very different. The, the media is very different, et cetera, et cetera. So again, it comes back to the research and insight. Mm -hmm. And I think you're absolutely right, Craig. And the word authentic really for us as well, whenever we're delivering something or doing it even within chapter two's world is absolutely, it, you, you don't have to spend a huge fortune on making content, um, you know, by all means make it professional. But the key thing is authentic because people, like you say, can absolutely spot if something is a stock image or it's, you know, it's not genuine um, content from people that work within Rico or chapter two or direct line, whatever it might be. Um, and, and we see that all the time, you know, when you're monitoring what people are, um, are engaging with on social media or on the career site, or whatever that might be. Um, it's, it's apparent very quickly that that's how it needs to continue. So I, you know, I agree. Um, so uh, one of the other questions that had just popped up as well. So um, I just want to make sure we're covering as we're sort of going, because I want to go back to the data conversation as well. I think that's a bigger a bigger piece that people are really interested in. Um, so Guy says, you mentioned the importance of talent engagement at the front end of the TA process. What activity has changed and what are you doing differently to stand out from the crowd? Which I think is a really great question because it's all about taking tangible kind of advice or actions from today. What can people be doing differently from, I suppose, end to end within the process to start to really stand out and compete with, you know, other larger brands, potentially better known brands, whatever it might be. So, so the, the, the thing that we're doing differently is, is probably a bit further back from where, or a bit further forward from where the question comes. So it's, um, it, it's trying to give that authentic voice very early in the process. Mm -hmm. So um, your, your typical kind of assessment cycle would be, you know, maybe a TA consultant through to manager, through to um, director or whatever. We're, we're bringing in peer level assessment much earlier into the process um, so that they are, candidates are speaking with people who are doing the role, who are working within RICO. They're not necessarily a decision maker yeah. and their role is not to assess. So we're not really asking, you know, we're not really asking them to assess the candidate. We're asking them to talk to the candidate 
honestly. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and we, we're finding that this is really powerful because, you know, that, that there's a real, it's, it's not quite the social media piece that we were talking about earlier, but it's the same principle that you get to meet somebody who is a, who is a colleague, who will be a colleague rather than a manager or an HR person really early on. We're finding that they're asking different questions. So the, the, the quality of conversation early in the process is, is different and you could argue better because there's a real honesty. And, and what we're not doing, crucially, is scripting in any way the individuals yeah. who are doing those assessments. So if they want to go on a call and say, I actually hate Rico and I, <laughs> I can't wait to leave, <laughs> well, that would be disappointing, <laughs> clearly. Um, but we're not we're not trying to influence what they say it, it's got to be a real conversation and, it, and it's actually completely low cost it helps with the engagement of the team because they're kind of getting a bit of an in, insight and input into who's going to be their their colleague and so it's very simple but it, it's about trying to get that real message across as soon as possible very, sim yeah. very simple but also very brave at the same time yeah. You've got to have people who believe in your brand and, and believe in the organization and the value as well. So, yeah, and I think I think that kind of represents where we are on our EVP journey, actually. So we're, mm. we're, we're much further back than you are, Craig, I think. So, so we're, we're at the stage of getting our own organization really right so that when we understand what that EVP is and take it to the market, it, it's truly authentic and you know it's um it, yeah so, so a lot of our focus is on our own employees getting that right because then when we take that to market it, it will be a very powerful message i think yeah <clears throat> yeah and i don't from my from my side i don't think there's one one piece of advice or one answer for this because i think it again it depends on so much around the industry that you're in and the, and the audience that you're trying to get hold of and I've tried some things in the past which have completely changed the way that careers websites have worked. So again, going away from this bombardment of information and reams of text and in candidates just get bored and you see your dwell rates go completely down and your bounce rate go completely high. So we, we delivered a chatbot that delivered everything that was very specific to somebody's individual journey. That was very different. And actually people were spending more time on the chatbot than they were on the on the typical website. So, but that was for a particular audience. We've tried and we've experimented with experimental, sorry, experiential events, so very much outdoor. We've looked at augmented reality. We've done the live pieces. Um, but again, it's got to be right for the audience. It's, there isn't one of those that I would say worked across every single um, yes. talent pool that we were looking at. But again, yeah. if you look at the theme throughout all of them, engagement authenticity yes yeah when we talk about the audience then because I know we touched on this the other day Craig so and we were talking about the audience almost as a whole but actually we you mentioned I think correct me if I'm wrong that you feel like what people want might have changed or evolved a little bit as well like how what are you seeing what what do people want these days what do we need to be thinking about when we're positioning ourselves as an employer of choice so the two, and again, really timely because we've done the, the EVP insight with internal and external, um, is flexibility and purpose. So yes. your salary used to always be up there. Or salary and benefits, number one, number two, it's not there. It's not even number three at the moment. Um, so if you look at, and you know, personally, I'm in exactly that same position. The last two years have had a major, major impact on pretty much everybody. But people, I mean, people have upped their lives and moved away. And, you know, they've moved their house, their family, et cetera, for a different way of life or more space because they didn't want to live in town centres, et cetera. And this whole flexible working piece is a, is a massive differentiator at the moment. You've seen yeah. lots of organisations now start to say, we want you back, come back into yeah. the office four or five days a week. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that proposition of what they sold probably six, 12 months ago is completely different. So yeah, yeah, flexibility is just an absolute clear number one, but also then purpose. And this comes back to, you know, why join an organization? What's the organization looking to do? Purpose for, as an individual, what am I going to get out of it? And mm -hmm. how are you going to help me? Coming back to Matt's, you know, one of his very first points, everybody wants development. We're, we're in this for 
mainly two things, which is enhance my CV and pay the mortgage or pay the rent. Yeah. It, and that's, that is a big piece of the purpose. So it's got to hit those ones. Mm-hmm. And then all the other pieces sit around, uh, you know, behaviors and values, et cetera, that sit around it. Yes. Yeah. And just on that point then, so Pete's asked a question around that. Um, and do you actually um, survey your employees around what engages and resonates with them as to why they join the company or a previous company to better understand what motivates them? Is that and then and then building that into the EVP? Is that something you monitor and are kind of constantly monitoring? So uh, on our on our journey at the moment, um, we've we've built that into all of the research and insight that we've been doing over the last three four months. Um, so each of our internal focus groups, we've got exactly those questions, which is where some of that feedback has come from. And then we will start testing and validating that moving forward. I can't say yeah. historically, obviously, because I've only been here six months. Yeah. Um, but we did similar in previous organizations as well. Yeah. What about you, Matt? Because I know, um, obviously, like you said, Rico has been a, quite a traditional company. There's a lot of change going on internally. How have you managed that? Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're, we're constantly, it seems like there's always some kind of survey. If, if anything, we might have <laughs> gone to the other extreme. But um, but it's it, part of it is about um, driving a culture of feedback as well and, 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 and ensuring that, people employees and future employees uh, know that we want to know what they think know that they can tell us what they think yeah. without fear of any retribution or, or anything like that and that we listen to what they say so mm-hmm. that that's a big part in building a mature trust you know trust driven organization yeah um, to lo- so, so there's so much data that I have to hand now that that kind of tells me what's happening the the other brilliant or maybe not brilliant maybe it's just maybe everybody does it but I I love what we've introduced recently in terms of surveying unsuccessful candidates as well as successful candidates through the process um through the external process because it's really easy to focus on the people who become employees and they're probably going to have a positive experience yeah probably not always um, but it's about also reaching out and engaging the people who didn't, who weren't selected, because you know what, they might be right in the future, but also from a quality of process and, and experience perspective, making sure that we're taking that into our considerations as well. So, you know, we, we want the people who aren't successful to be as positive about Rico as the people who were, you know, were successful. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to get their feedback is is where you're going to learn, not the most, but certainly a lot, isn't it, about how to, to improve and, and that kind of thing. So absolutely. Um, oh, we've got a quick question I wanted to touch on. Oh, from Taylor. Um, when you're missing out on hires, what tends to be the most common reason people are deciding to join other businesses? It's a tough one. <laughs> okay, first, Craig, well, I think. Oh, yeah, thanks, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Jenna, the last six months counter offer. Yeah, yes. it's that old chestnut of you know you're not valued in your current organisation until you have that conversation that says I've been offered a little bit more somewhere else, and then they go, oh dear, we need to hold on to you because it's going to be too much hassle to try and replace you, and we'll have we'll end up having to pay more anyway. That oh. that is that is most definitely one of them. Um, I'd say actually the the conversations with our candidates. And it's not a reason that people are turning us down because we are quite different at the moment is around the flexibility. That's the reason that they're in the market. That's the reason they're, that they're, you know, they're engaging in the having conversations. Um, so I can't talk for other organizations, but I would probably say that is probably up there. Just while Matt's thinking, I was going to say counter offer is ch- very challenging. And also, um, I don't know if you're finding but multiple offer, you know, where people are literally receiving three, four offers. And then you think you've, you think that you've got a great relationship. You think it's coming together and then actually they go elsewhere because they've got four offers on the table. It's a very, very challenging market. And, and the pace, you know, we, we you know, we, we move relatively quickly with our recruitment processes, but not at the detriment of the quality of the process. Sure. And I just think anybody who can turn around, especially at senior levels a, a recruitment process in five days there's got to be questions that said is you know have they put the rigor yes. and the controls behind that mechanism to make sure mm-hmm. that it's right for both parties mm-hmm. yeah no very valid point 
think I think all of that clearly. Um, I think the one thing that's um, sticking out to me is, um, and I don't necessarily see. I don't see this as a, a bad thing, but it, it, it's when people get to know the real organisation. So we're really keen that they understand who we are. Yes. The reality is that isn't for everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and we're, we're really, that's that's cool. We're okay with that. Mm. Um, we're wanting to find that out during that assessment and, and, and through the recruitment process. So we're often getting down to the, the final knockings of the process, having really straight conversations with people. And they're, and, and brilliantly they're saying this isn't for me now that that sounds all wrong you're all kind of going that's wrong what you know, what went wrong nothing yeah. went wrong mm-hmm. that is that is fine we, we can live with that as, as long as it's a you know it's it's a well thought through discussion you know grown up to grown up that we're having that's cool we, we can live with that so that, that's another thing that I think we're seeing a little bit of it probably doesn't appear massively in the statistics but it's one that sticks out for me that I kind of quite I'm interested in it and I kind of quite like it in a weird way yeah I agree with that you know if it's not the right fit that's okay as long as you're having very transparent conversations and feedback then actually it can be beneficial to both parties but it doesn't mean it has to be a yes you know so yeah. I agree um Right, I'm conscious of time. I've got a question here from Polisa as well, though, which is really, um, really important. In terms of success and me- measuring success, what are the most important analytics or metrics that you use to track how well your TA team is doing? I think that's quite a, an old school question, and I like it because I think probably as time has evolved, actually, what is success these days? You know, is it a time to fill? Is it? Is it? What is? What is it? It's not great. Time. Oh. it's not no no, no, no absolutely not. I mean. <laughs> it's definitely not time to fill what is it now <laughs> well we're um we've we've literally in the last few months just started a new measure which i have to say my team hate um, but they'll get used to it um <laughs> is um how well are people doing in the organization so this is a real long-term view so we're, we're we're tracking people one and two years post joining rico mm-hmm. how are they doing so what's their performance like behaviorally and values wise how are they mapping to to what we're we're trying to achieve and it and it's about it's back to what i was just saying actually it's about making sure through the through the process that we're being very transparent and very authentic um, because filling a vacancy is so short term it's scary yeah it gets it off somebody's desk it it kind of stops the manager you know bashing down your door every every few days but actually it's not it's not what we're here to achieve we're actually here to achieve value for the organization bringing in great talent who fit and work and and bring value to Rico. That's actually what it's all about. And, and if we're not achieving that, the rest, you better not bother hiring the person in the first place. <laughs> almost, you know. So it so we we've figured out ways. It's always been a bit of a goal to get there, but now we have the right systems which allow us to accurately track that. Yes. And, yeah. So I think that's the the massive change we've seen in Rico recently. Mm-hmm. In, the, in the interest of time, I completely agree with Matt. Yeah. Um, I'd also say candidate and hiring manager satisfaction. Yeah. Yeah. As, as long as you get the questions right and you've got the willingness to act on some of the feedback that you get through. But I would never go, uh, and again, time to offer and source of and all those types of things. You know, do we measure them? Yes, we've got measures against them, but are they absolutely critical? No. The actual analytics around the engagement at the beginning of your process can tell you a hell of a lot because that's mm-hmm. actually where a lot of your problems will start. Yeah. So everything, even from dwell time on your on your careers website, not many people look at the journey that somebody goes through. So where they land, if it's a, a direct application or referral through a platform, what pages do they have a look at? Where are the heat maps? Where what's what information are they serving? How long are they yeah. staying on those pages? That can tell you a, a heap of information about what you need to dial up, but also what you need to dial down. Yeah, I think that's really 
really good advice actually Craig because I think that's absolutely right no one's not no one some people maybe not be looking at that before the physical interactions that's actually started what what's going on behind the scenes and like you say sometimes that might be part of the biggest challenge so um understand that better and then you might you know create a smoother pr process for yourself um one final thing if you're okay for time I just wanted to touch on data because I feel like it's a, a huge topic that we can't we could have spent the whole hour talking about but um I wanted to just talk about it in terms of a longer term strategy and Craig you mentioned this the other day and Matt you've obviously just mentioned the likes of course fly etc which are absolutely beneficial to to us to any organization but how do you or how are you starting to use data as part of that longer term strategy uh, so from my but it's similar to what Matt has already mentioned earlier which is we're looking out longer term at future talent in the organization um, yeah. And actually what some of the stuff like what you've mentioned there, Sophie, is going to tell us is, do these people exist? Yes. Because it's all very well. We could go out and flog a vacancy for 900 days and completely impact our time to offer and time to hire, where yeah. we just say there's, there's nobody that exists. But with that future lens on, actually, if there's no one at that level doing that role at that particular moment in time, where do they come from? Where's the next step down in that ladder? How do you then go about mapping the market and saying, right, there's 400 of these people. Where are the shining lights? Where are they based in the UK? What are the salary levels? And having a look at that piece. But at the same yeah. time, understanding in, in various areas where you have that issue, you're going to have to start growing your own. So it's a completely different conversation to, again, Matt, my manager banging on the door saying, I can't fill this vacancy. Okay, here's the reasons why what are we going to do about it? And it's that so what conversation that data and all of these metrics now are enabling us to have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, well, we're building, it's not ready yet, but a whole HR data insights team, which is all about really the strategic nature of talent is actually what it boils down to so that we can use data to inform our strategic decisions at a business level and at an HR level. And yeah. that then starts to drive your activity. And, and the, the, you know, the, the great example Craig just gave there around, so we, we know we're going to need a lot of this in the future. We know it's very rare today. So what are we going to do? Wait until we get there and discover there aren't anybody, or are we going to start doing something about it now? Yes, and yeah. so it's, and, and I think this is the big theme for me is we're all talent acquisition. Um, and, and I think personally, I've, I've really enjoyed being a separate part of HR in a way we're a little bit different from HR. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think that's changing massively. Um, and we, we have to start to embrace, if we don't already, the fact that we're part of a much bigger HR infrastructure, a critical part of that infrastructure, by the way. Mm -hmm. But but piecing it all together and thinking much more holistically about people and talent actually has a massive positive impact on how we how we operate within talent acquisition and i think yes. that's that's my big thing of the moment i think and yeah. it drives those top level conversations so yeah. again if that if the data in the mi is telling you there's 500 of these types of engineers but they're all based in glasgow and then the, what the conversation is, so what are we going to do? How do we get hold of those people? Do we open a hub in Glasgow? Are we going to be, so, and, and organizations you've seen, the likes of BT, et cetera, are now picking up offices or opening up new offices. And it's got to be based on some of this information. Yeah. yeah. Such strategic decision. <laughs> Last the, at the last webinar, Lucy, who heads up early careers at GSK, made a really good point that because of the current market and the challenge, the, the challenges that people might be facing with TA, now's the time. You know, we've suddenly there's a there's an opportunity to be talking to the board and putting forward ideas. And whereas before it might not, you might not have had that opportunity. They're listening, they're understanding, and then having that data there to support what your what your argument is or your recommendations. You're looking for this person, but they don't exist. Let's widen that, you know, that that geographical, whatever it might be. Yeah. Now's the time to be doing that. So completely agree with that. Um, just to finish, um, Taylor's asked if there's any recruitment technology that you use alongside your ATS. So, Matt, you, you mentioned horse flight. Is there any others that you kind of find beneficial? Um, no, 
not purely for TA. I'd go back to my point about HR though. So, yeah, sure. so it's the learning systems, it's the performance system. So it's adjacent to talent acquisition. Increasingly, yeah. we're playing in that world. That's the reality, but not, not pure TA apart from some of the tools like Horsefly. Yeah. Similar. Absolutely similar. We're also looking at another solution, which is again based around data, which actually links nicely into our ATS yeah. that will allow us to yeah to report at a more granular level as well, but also give us insight with uh, with the market at the same time. Brilliant. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, just having a quick look, if we end the poll there. Um, so we were asking how much um, has your talent strategy changed in the last five years? Um, and the majority of people, 59% said there is a major shift and we need help um, to start to think outside the box. So um, hopefully some of the um, takeaways from today have been beneficial. Thank you so much um, to Matt and to Craig for joining us. Um, some really good conversations, some really good topics and, and definitely some thought provoking um, ideas that, that hopefully the audience can take away. So thank you very much to everybody. Everyone's saying thank you on the chat. Um, it's a pleasure. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Honestly, guys, it's been really great to have you here and to have your thoughts and, and your processes behind all of that. So brilliant. We will see you again soon. And uh, yes, thank you very much.